Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame and electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly 1,000 feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Luscantire Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day making it way more dramatic in monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built the last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind, too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes Al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now, this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal-clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic, with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. 
What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called a sueda salsa dwells in the salt water. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So, even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socatra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the Dragon Tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight-burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world! The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground, even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity a human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. Hey, ever heard of a fire rainbow? Yeah, me neither. How about a circumhorizontal arc? Didn't think so, but just so you know, they're one and the same thing. At first glance, it looks like a painting, or like a rainbow-colored splash in the sky. Despite the name, they have nothing in common with either fire or rain. This phenomenon happens on rare occasions when the sun shines through a particular type of ice cloud formation. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, a specific type of ice crystals and clouds needs to be present for the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. 
The only difference will be that moon halos are usually white, and sun halos can be rainbow-colored. When visiting regions with high altitudes, you may be one of the lucky people to stumble upon penitentes. They're basically naturally formed ice spikes. For them to be formed, they need a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor rather than melting it into water. And that's why these blades of snow and ice start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. As cute as they may be, they can end up as tall as 15 feet. Now, what happens when small individual droplets of lava meet the wind? Pele's hair, basically. Let me explain. The word Pele comes from an ancient Hawaiian symbol for volcanoes. Whenever the wind picks up little drops of lava, it stretches them into hair-like strands, similar to the process of glass wire creation. These delicate strands can stretch as far as 6 feet. On rare occasions, it can rain without any clouds. But does it really? Let's look at the science behind this rare phenomenon. It's sometimes called a sun shower, just because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. Let's be clear though, there is no way rain can ever come down directly from a star. Rain clouds are at a bit of a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Add a little wind to blow the rain in your direction, and ta-da! You get sun showers. Located in Bolivia is a place called Salar de Uni. It's the largest salt flat in the world. It's also the home of half of the world's lithium, which is a crucial component for making batteries. But what else is so special about this place? Well, whenever the rain season comes, it turns this piece of flat land into a perfectly reflective mirror lake. What comes to your mind when you hear about the Blood Falls? A horror movie? <laughs> well, they are merely a series of waterfalls located in one of the driest regions of Antarctica. They emerge from an underground lake filled with a special kind of bacteria. These little organisms use sulfates as fuel instead of sugars, which makes them very intriguing for scientists. The water contained in this lake is so full of iron that it basically just rusts when it meets the air. Hence, the reddish color of the waterfall, which also gives it its trademark name. Okay, we all know the song, but it's not really made up. There is actually such a thing called a desert rose. It's not a plant, though, but a unique form of the mineral gypsum. It develops in dry sandy places that can occasionally flood. This constant switching between a wet and dry environment lets the gypsum crystals emerge between grains of sand, trapping them and forming a rose-like shape. Ever heard of the Eye of Sahara? Scientists are still trying to figure out how it was formed. You can only see it if you fly above it, but it's basically a naturally formed dome that dates back to approximately 100 million years ago. And no, I wasn't around then. It has a rough diameter of 25 miles and consists of a bunch of concentric rings. The biggest one, or the central area, measures about 19 miles in diameter. Astronauts were some of the first people to notice it, and it's been studied ever since. In fact, even to this day, when landing in Florida, they know they're almost home when they see the Eye of Sahara. One of the most beautifully colored trees in the world is located in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's called the Rainbow Eucalyptus. It got its name because of its bark that switches colors and peels away as the tree ages. The bright green bark is the youngest, as it contains a substance called chlorophyll, usually found in leaves. It then switches to purple and then to the color red. And finally, it turns brown as it grows and loses the chlorophyll. Now, don't be tricked into thinking that's a whole forest. It's one single tree. And no, it's not some sort of optical illusion either. Let me explain. Underneath that soil, there is a complex network of roots that connects around 47,000 tree-like shapes you see above the ground. It's called the quaking aspen. Some of these trees are among the oldest and largest organisms in the world. Now, here's a good destination for all travelers, or maybe not so good after all. The most lightning-stricken area in the world, according to recent data released by NASA, is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. Out of all the days in a year, 
300 of them feature thunderstorms in this location. What makes this area so unique, though, that storms happen so often? Well, it's because where cool mountain air meets the warm, moist breeze and generates electricity over the lake. The Eternal Flame Falls are located in upstate New York, near the Canadian border. In this region, there is a tiny waterfall with a big secret – a spark about 8 inches tall. Turns out there's a natural gas seat that provides fuel to the flame behind the waterfall. The waterfall provides enough coverage so that it stays lit pretty much every time. Hikers do enjoy to relight it if they see that it's been blown out. This phenomenon is actually quite common, but this one gained more popularity because it is younger than most. And it looks very good in pictures, let's be honest. I've heard of yellow sand, white sand, and even black sand here or there. But I've never heard of green beaches until now. Papacolia, also known as Green Sand Beach, is located in Hawaii and is one of the few beaches in the world that features green sand. The unique coloring comes from olivine rock that was formed when a nearby volcano erupted. Actually, in Hawaii, all the volcanoes are nearby. Move over green sands because some of the other beaches around the world can even glow at night. And it's completely natural. The culprit? A little thing called photoplankton, or microalgae, as they're sometimes called. They're basically little plants that contain chlorophyll and need sunlight in order to live and grow. Most photoplankton kinds are able to float in the upper part of the ocean, where the sunlight can still reach them beneath the water. When the photoplankton gets agitated by the movement of waves and currents, they emit light, which looks like some glow during the night. These special microorganisms are found on beaches in a lot of places around the world, such as the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and the Everglades. At the base of a mountain located just outside of Afton, Wyoming, is a little river called the Intermittent Spring. There are only three of this kind in the whole world, but what makes this little string of water so mysterious? Well, the fact that it starts and stops every few minutes. Scientists have yet to pinpoint precisely why this happens. They speculate that it's basically just a siphon effect that happens deep within the ground that causes the river to just start and stop so often. Should you ever be interested in checking it out, be sure to do so in the late summer, as that's when the intermittent spring is most active. Do you see the irony here? You can only see the spring in the summer? Okay, I'm done. Now, did you know that our sun is actually green? Okay, okay, I'm kidding. But in reality, it's all colors you can imagine at the same time. Wait, what? I know it sounds like a joke, but I'm being serious, can't you tell? In fact, our sun contains absolutely all the waves of the light spectrum. It's simultaneously red, blue, green, yellow, you name it. Where do you think rainbows come from? When sunlight gets reflected off water droplets in the air, it splits into a bunch of colored waves that we can see individually. And when they're all together, we see a white ray of light. Our eyes are unable to perceive the concept of all colors at the same time, so their combination seems white to us. Wait, you might say, why white? Isn't the sun yellow? Yep, it's yellow too, but please don't stare at the sun just to make sure. It appears white when we see it from the International Space Station. This is the sun's real color as our eyes perceive it. The sun gets a yellowish hue when its rays get scattered in Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere doesn't let the blue rays of the spectrum pass very well. But the red ones? Hey, sure, why not? By the way, that's why the sky seems blue to us. The atmosphere scatters the blue color all over the place. During sunrise and sunset, short blue waves get reflected but the long red ones reach us perfectly. That's why we see sunsets as pink, orange, or red. But what would happen if the sun had a different color? To answer this question, let's quickly repeat what we've learned. 1. The sun has the whole color spectrum in it. 2. Our atmosphere is like blue rays? No. Nope. Red rays? Anytime. So you probably already guessed what would happen if the sun was, let's say, red. The whole world would look like it does during sunsets. Not bad, huh? We wouldn't even have to wait for the evening to admire the scarlet sky. Orange water and a bright red moon. Yeah, it would be darker than what we're used to, but still not bad. Oh, by the way, one day, 
the sun will actually turn red. When its life comes to an end, it will expand and gradually turn into a red giant before finally burning out. But uh, it's not going to be so much fun for us. So let's hope we won't be around to see that moment. I know I won't. Hey, I've got a party to go to. Okay, now, what if the sun was green? Well, the truth is, the sun is green. So here's your dialogue. Wait, are you kidding me? Didn't you just say that it's white? Ooh, good job on that, by the way. Well, not exactly, bud. The sun just looks white. But technically, it has a temperature of around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pink wavelength of the sun's spectrum corresponds to the green-blue hue. But to make sure that the sun is green, we need to drown out the rest of the visible spectrum. Then our atmosphere will let through a pure green color. And what'll happen then? Well, everything will be green. And everything will also be a bit darker. Well, face it, it's not easy being green. Okay, moving on. Now let's paint the sun blue. Blue stars actually do exist. They're called blue giants. Fortunately, our sun is not one of them. Why fortunately? Well, because if it was a blue giant, it would be a young, beautiful, unimaginably large, and very, very hot star. See, our red is hot, blue is cold logic doesn't apply to stars. The hottest stars are white and blue, and the coldest are yellow and red. Yeah, our sun is actually very cold compared to other stars. Now, take the average temperature in your city, but multiply it like by hundreds of thousands. Yeah, we're struggling with global warming here, but global burning? Eh, no thanks, blue giants. Anyway, let's imagine that the sun turned blue. How would we see the world? Surprisingly, nothing would change. Remember how I said that the atmosphere scatters blue light? That's why, in this case, everything would remain almost the same. Maybe the sky would get bluer, but we wouldn't see much difference. And finally, the darkest, pun intended, option. What if our sun turned black? Stock up on lamps and candles because there is no more light. People use electricity all over the world 24-7. We also can't see the moon anymore. After all, we can observe it these days only because the sun's rays get reflected off of it. Now, the only thing we still have to illuminate our nights are stars, but they don't help us much. Good thing this scenario is totally unrealistic and there are no black stars, right? Well, yeah, there are no black stars, and still our sun will eventually become completely black one day. And I don't mean a black hole. I'm talking about black dwarfs here. You've probably heard of white dwarfs, maybe even seven dwarfs. When a star like our sun is about to finish its life, it expands and turns into a red giant. And then, gradually losing its upper layers, it turns into white dwarfs. Since they no longer produce fuel, they slowly cool down. All that remains is a small core, living out its life and burning bright. And when the star cools down completely, right, it turns into a black dwarf. But you've probably never heard of them. Why? Because, surprise, surprise, they don't exist. And no, I was not lying. The thing is, a star needs about one quadrillion years to turn into a black dwarf. And our universe is still a baby. It's only about 14 billion years old. So no star has reached this stage yet. Even the most ancient of them still emit a little light. That's why black stars are just a theory. And it's unlikely that we'll ever see such a star at all. But remember the famous saying, the stars that we see at night are already ghosts because their light has reached us only now. Well, that's a myth. They're all still alive. Why am I telling you all this? Well, let's imagine that our sun turned into a black dwarf the entire solar system would immediately get plunged into absolute darkness. It would also be terribly cold. The moon would leave its orbit and crash into Earth. Wait, no. Let's overlook this moment and assume we're still alive. Fortunately, we wouldn't freeze instantly, as you might think. Earth's core has its own temperature, more than 9,000 degrees. But the temperatures on the surface of the planet would still immediately drop to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The core would gradually cool down. Every two months, its temperature would drop by two times. In just two months, Earth's surface temperature would be minus 190 degrees, and in a year, it would reach minus 450 degrees. Most plants would disappear pretty quickly, not because of the cold, but because of the lack of photosynthesis. Others would live a little longer thanks to the oxygen still remaining in the atmosphere. And, oddly enough, trees would survive for a very long time. 
They have a slow metabolism and get sugar from the ground. The upper layer of the oceans would freeze very quickly. Fortunately, this thick crust of ice would insulate deep waters, so the entire ocean wouldn't freeze for some time. Marine creatures would be doing pretty well. They existed long before us and are already used to crazy temperature changes, the lack of oxygen and food, huge pressures, and other joys of deep-sea life. And what about us humans? Well, first of all, we'd start getting sick. Without vitamin D, people would face a huge number of different health problems. Also, our bodies need sunlight to produce melatonin. This melatonin helps us understand when we should go to bed and wake up. If people didn't have this hormone, their bodies would get very confused and wouldn't understand whether they needed to sleep or not. That would mean insomnia for many people. But we would still be able to survive. We'd have two options to build giant submarines and go down into the depths of the ocean closer to Earth's core, or stay on the surface, living our lives in some location where we'd have sources of geothermal energy. In Iceland, for example. We could also settle near volcanoes. Their heat would be enough to warm us for a long time. Our vision would adapt to the dark, but at some point, it would reach its maximum. So we'd need to get used to living in complete darkness. But who knows? Maybe we would adapt to this life, too. So, which option would you prefer? Living at the bottom of the ocean in a submarine or on the surface near volcanoes? 80% of what's deep inside the world's oceans remains hidden to this day. That's because the ocean covers 70% of the planet's surface, and we only have access to a small portion of that. We can clearly see around 3 miles deep down inside the ocean. So it's no surprise that our most recent discoveries when it comes to wildlife come from the ocean. I mean, there's a lot to explore, like this new shark species called the genie's dogfish, or the longest animal ever found, a 154-foot-long jellyfish, which we just stumbled upon earlier this year in Australia. Somewhere in the Arctic and Antarctic seas, a strange phenomenon appears, confusing people to say the least. It's called frost flowers, but they're not plants at all, merely ice crystals. Frost grows on the long stem plants that manage to break the thin layer on the surface of young sea ice. Frost flowers aren't just made of water, though. They have a variety of microorganisms within, making them a small, temporary ecosystem. Turns out we don't have volcanoes just on the visible surface of the Earth. Submarine volcanoes are just as disruptive to their surrounding wildlife. If the data we have so far is correct, the ocean has the most productive volcanic systems on Earth, most of them being on average 8,500 feet below the surface of the water. A maelstrom, a powerful and at times dangerous whirlpool, is a source of nightmares for seafarers to this day. What sets a maelstrom apart from other whirlpools is that it comes in an extraordinary size and force. It's so powerful, it can even put larger ships in a lot of trouble. One of the most famous of them is called Naruto, and it's located near Awaji Island. Its tides move in and out from 8 to 12 miles per hour twice a day, making it one of the fastest in the world. The sinking of the Titanic is the historical event that made icebergs famous, am I right? Well, sometimes these icebergs even come with colored stripes. They can be brown, black, green, yellow, and blue. Obviously, they're called striped icebergs, and they get their colors from various natural reasons. Like the blue ones, for example, which turn up when the ice melts and freezes back up very quickly. If there are green stripes in the iceberg, it probably means it has some algae stuck somewhere in there. Other more earth tone colors, like brown, yellow, or black, have other things to blame, like sediments the seawater picks up before freezing. Back in March 2019, scientists stumbled upon one of the most baffling phenomena ever to be found in the sea. During the exploration of one of the underwater volcanoes, they noticed what looked like a small lake, which was upside down. It was at least 6,500 feet below sea level. If you think that doesn't make any sense, well, that's because it's not real. Turns out it was nothing more than an optical illusion generated by the liquid in these upside-down pools. 
It gets up to 320 degrees Fahrenheit high and is made of some harsh chemicals like sulfur and metals, which makes the illusion possible. The world's largest waterfall is also safely tucked underwater. It's located beneath the Denmark Strait, a portion of water that stands between Iceland and Greenland. If you suddenly grow fish gills, dive in there, and manage to comfortably breathe underwater, you'll be able to see a series of waterfalls that begin at 2,000 feet under the surface, but then drop down to a depth of 10,000 feet. In 2011, Swedish treasure hunters discovered an object on the bottom of the Baltic Sea that they described as strange and mysterious. It's oval shaped with unusual stair formations. The head of the team who made the discovery supposed it must have been constructed tens of thousands of years ago, even before the Ice Age, and could have been part of the underwater city of Atlantis. Experts who analyzed the object believe it to be a regular glacial deposit or some other natural formation, but they still don't know for sure. Now, they don't call it the Black Sea for nothing. Located at the southeastern extremity of Europe, it even has sea smoke which is basically steam coming out of the surface of the water. This happens because of the humidity of the oceanic water, which neutralizes the cooler wind blowing on the water surface, creating this vapor-like phenomenon. If you ever check out the ocean surface during sunset and sunrise, you might get lucky enough to see green flashes. You'll have to pay attention, though, because it merely lasts for a couple of seconds. They happen because of the natural prismatic effect of the atmosphere of the Earth. During sunsets and sunrises, light emerging from the sun gets diverged into multiple colors, a process that looks like there's a green flash emitted by the water. Red tides do happen a lot of times, and although there's no need to panic when you see one of those, you still must be careful. The technical term for this phenomenon is algal blooming. It happens when there's a rapid growth or blooming of algae in the waters of the ocean. Because of the chemicals these algae contain, they may be trouble for birds, animals, and even humans. So don't be so quick to jump into the waters should you ever experience it. Octopuses and squid have a special trait that sets them apart from other sea creatures. They have three hearts. While Valentine's Day must be very special for them. It doesn't necessarily make them more romantic, but they do need these three hearts to function properly. They have one major heart that helps with circulation all around their bodies, and two bronchial hearts that are responsible for pumping near their gills. So, with three hearts and eight arms, when the octopus hugs you, you'll know she's very sincere. Based on a study published in 2013, dolphins have names for each other particularly bottlenose dolphins, which have their own special whistles, just like human names. Not only do they develop this type of whistle to present themselves to other dolphins, but they can also learn other such names so they can better communicate with each other. In the depths of the Pacific Ocean, there's a mysterious singing whale, which scientists have yet to fully understand. They call it the loneliest whale because it emits sounds at a much higher pitch than any other blue whale we've ever encountered. No one has ever seen it, though, so researchers believe its strange tune may be keeping it from actually finding a partner. Oh. Now, standard blue whales have their own particular quirk. Their hearts are more than 5 feet long. They're also about 4 feet wide and can weigh more than 400 pounds. Just to give you a better idea, your heart is roughly the size of your fist, so that would be smaller. Not that we aren't a bit intimidated by sea creatures already, but just so you know, sharks can sometimes grow thousands of teeth. And not just one or two thousand, up to 30,000 teeth over their lifetime to be precise. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see a shark's dentist bill. (laughs) Something to chew on. Scientists have yet to identify a creature on Earth that can actually live forever, but it looks like this is about to change. A tiny jellyfish that's even smaller than the nail on your pinky appears to be the living embodiment of Benjamin Button. That's because it has the ability to go back to a previous developing stage whenever it's endangered or extremely hungry and out of food. It's no surprise they earn themselves the nickname, the Immortal Jellyfish. 
We've known about this species for hundreds of years, but it took us until the 1990s to discover their unique characteristics. We're yet to be sure how it's able to produce cells that regress and regrow, but they could hold a secret that might help advances in medicine for both animals and humans. So, does the mysterious devil's gardens in the Amazon rainforest ring any bells? Eh, don't worry. It's not some spooky phenomenon. It's the work of some tiny but mighty insects called the lemon ants. These ants inject a natural herbicide, formic acid, into any other plant that is not the tree species that they call home. By doing this, they create a space for their treehouse saplings to grow allowing the ant colony to expand as it occupies new nesting sites in the saplings. That's some efficient gardening, if you ask me. But don't be fooled. These devil gardens are not just a bunch of boring old trees. In fact, they are botanical anomalies that grow very slowly every year, and some of them are over 800 years old. Who knew ants could create such impressive and long-lasting structures? Of course, the rainforest is still one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth, with a remarkable diversity of plant life. But it's fascinating to see the control ants can have over their environment, creating single-species structures in such a complex ecosystem. But where does the name Devil's Garden come from? We know ants are to blame, but is there something else hiding in the Amazon rainforest? Well, picture this. You're strolling along, taking in the lush foliage, when suddenly you stumble upon a clearing. But wait, there's something strange about this patch of land. There's no vegetation, just a handful of trees standing alone in the dirt. What's going on here? It's easy to understand why people came up with this name after seeing the weird stretch of vegetation. And as humans do, they came up with quite an impressive legend to back up the story. It was said that the inhabitant of this eerie oasis was a shape-shifting evil spirit. Like me. Heh, <laughs> just kidding. This little guy may have looked like a misshapen person walking on one hoof and one human foot. But don't be fooled. He supposedly had a whole bag of tricks up his sleeve, including the ability to transform into someone you know and lead you down the path to doom. Hey, it's just a myth. But you have to admit it was quite convincing, right? Clever landscaping ants aside, there are a lot of unsolved mysteries hidden in the Amazon rainforest. Like its unusual geoglyphs, for example. Humans have been getting creative with the Earth's surface for ages. Geoglyphs are just one of the many ways we've left our mark on this planet. Basically, we take some sand or stones, move them around a bit, and voila! We've got ourselves a funky design that pops against the backdrop of the ground. A new study found that the area was home to up to 1 million people before Columbus first arrived in the New World back in 1492. That's a lot of people, and they left behind some pretty cool stuff. The Amazon rainforest is already amazing, with 1 in 10 known species in the world living there, and 1 in 5 of Earth's birds. But did you know that over the past few decades, archaeologists have discovered evidence of numerous large complex societies that may have inhabited Amazonia? It turns out that the Amazon rainforest was not just a pristine wilderness, but a hub of human activity as well. These South American geoglyphs are particularly interesting. They're these huge structures that combine square, circular, and hexagonal shapes. Archaeologists have found very few remains of habitation inside the enclosures, which suggests they were not settlements. Instead, the most likely explanation is that they were used for ceremonial gatherings. The exact function of these structures is still a mystery, though. To find out how widespread human settlements were in the Amazon, scientists focus on the basin of the upper reaches of the Tapius River, a major tributary of the Amazon. Using satellite images, they discovered 81 new archaeological sites in the upper Tapios Basin, with a total of 104 earthworks. That means there is no gap in the network of earthworks spanning across Amazonia's southern rim. When researchers conducted ground surveys of 24 of these sites, they found evidence that the sites they visited were once inhabited. These sites dated from 1250 to 1500 CE and range from about 100 to 1300 feet wide. The largest were typically hexagonal fortified settlements, 
suggesting a certain degree of planning and uniformity in their construction. Based on the size and distributions of the earthworks, the researchers suggested that similar settlements may have extended over about 154,000 square miles of the southern rim of the Amazon, supporting a population of between 500,000 and 1 million people in late pre-Columbian times. Of course, the new study doesn't mean the Amazon rainforest was ever a teeming megalopolis. It's still mostly uncharted, so we have no idea how pre-Columbian populations were distributed across Amazonia. But it's exciting to learn about these ancient societies and the cool things they left behind. The scientists plan to do more excavations in the Upper Tapios Basin to refine their understanding of the cultural developments there. Who knows what they'll find next? Maybe a lost city full of treasure and adventure. Also hidden in the vast habitat of the Amazon is this next quirky creature. Ever heard of the Amazon Pink River Dolphins? Unfortunately, there is still so much we don't know about them. First things first, though, let's talk about what they look like. So picture this, a small, light-colored dolphin with a pink nose and lips. Ah, they're the Barbie of dolphins! Aside from that, they look like regular dolphins with plump bodies, bulbous foreheads, skinny snouts, chubby cheeks, and small eyes. They can be found in countries like Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. They're also the only species of river dolphin found in the Amazon River. Unfortunately, these little guys are officially critically endangered species, so there are not many specimens available that scientists can study. No other name is more famous when it comes to exploring the Amazon rainforest than that of Percy Fawcett. He dedicated his life to exploring the area in search of a lost city. And not just any city, but an ancient, mysterious city that he called Z. Sounds like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie, right? Percy was born in England in 1867 and had quite a career before he started exploring. But he didn't let his profession hold him back from following his dreams of exploring South America. In fact, he made seven expeditions to the Amazon between 1906 and 1924, each time getting closer to uncovering the secrets of Z. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how large the Amazon rainforest is. How big is it? I asked myself. It's so big that you could fit the whole of the UK and Ireland into it a whopping 17 times. That's a lot of trees and animals to navigate through. But Percy was up for the challenge. Despite his best efforts, Percy never found the lost city of Z. And sadly, he disappeared during his final expedition in 1925. But his legacy lived on through the years, inspiring many to become archaeologists and explorers themselves. In fact, a book called The Lost City of Z was written about Percy's adventures and was even made into a movie. It's not all hidden mysteries and wild nature out there. There are around a million indigenous folks living their best lives in the Amazon rainforest. That's right, they hunt, fish, farm, and even have access to Western medicine and education. But here's the kicker. Not all of these folks are keen on socializing with outsiders. And can you blame them? For years, loggers, miners, and ranchers have been, shall we say, behaving badly toward these communities. It's no wonder that some tribes have chosen to stay isolated and protect themselves from the dangers of the outside world. In fact, in 2018, Brazilian authorities were able to snap a photo of a man dubbed the indigenous man in the hole. He's the last remaining member of his tribe. But don't feel too bad for him. He's doing just fine on his own and has made it pretty clear that he's not interested in outside visitors. The authorities still leave him some seeds and tools, though, so it's not all bad news. The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. 
Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up! The Rich Hat structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua. But I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island in special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedskallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's, of course, a legend behind this mystery, too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! 
Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks, yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Leh wow. City, India, where, instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes. Yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help but notice that many mysterious things on Earth involve stones or rocks or methane. Which one of these phenomena is your favorite? You're traveling through Google Earth to find the perfect vacation spot when suddenly you come across something pretty unusual. It's a desert, ocean, forest, and lake all in one place. Lake Repa in Senegal got its pink color from the algae, producing a red pigment absorbing sunlight. White beaches and sandy dunes separate the lake from the Atlantic Ocean. The best time to see it is from November to June, during the dry season when it's the brightest. Around 3,000 people work at the lake every day, collecting salt that it's full of. Because of that, the fish living here are four times smaller than those in a normal environment. The lake is also famous because the Dakar Rally used to have its finish line here. You reach for a soda and accidentally scroll down from your new favorite destination. Two minutes of scrolling later, you realize you've found an introvert's dream. The island of Tristan da Cunha is an active volcano that hosts the most remote permanent settlement in the world. It's home to around 250 people, and their nearest neighbors are 1,800 miles away. Talk about distant relatives. The only way to get there is by boat, and it's a six-day long trip from Cape Town. You need special permission to set foot on the island, and ticket sales are super limited. Well, let's scroll back to civilization. The Atacama Desert in Chile looks like a pretty empty place, except for… is that a giant hand? This art piece by a local artist is about as tall as a telephone pole. They have to scrub off words and phrases left on the hand by vandals who travel here despite the remoteness of the structure. 
We still have plenty of places to go, so let's move on to… Wow! Looks like there's a bird inside a volcano in the Mexican state of Baja, California. A team of over 100 people worked on this piece of art. They wanted to create an identity for a local tribe that believes vultures are wise teachers for humans. Yeah, vultures. The place is free to visit, but you'd have to hike to the peak of the hill to see the bird. Time to get under the water. You wouldn't expect to see much except for corals and fish, but here it is. The Cancun Underwater Museum of Art has a total of 500 sculptures standing in three separate galleries. Most of them are designed by a British sculptor. The idea of the museum is to save the nearby coral reefs by giving divers a cool alternative destination. Now let's get out of the water for a moment and dive back in here. Looks like there's some researchers working and living at 63 feet below the surface. This is Aquarius Habitat in the Florida Keys, an underwater scientific lab. Scientists nicknamed Aquanauts can stay here on their research missions for up to 10 days. And this must be a giant Mickey head. This is the largest Mickey in Walt Disney World, and it's a solar farm with a power of around 1,000 residential solar rooftop systems. It's feeding renewable energy to the park. Let's check out a less famous spot. Clinton F. McClintic State Wildlife Station. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Looks like a regular state park in West Virginia. Let's zoom in and walk around a bit. Everything is all right here, except, whoa, is that a human-sized fly? Moving on, let's zoom in here, over the north rim of the Grand Canyon, a little further. It looks like a polka dot pattern near the cinder cone volcano called Vulcan's Throne. The desert around the canyon is home to plenty of red harvester ants. What you see here is their nesting mounds surrounded by bare grounds. Scientists call it the Las Vegas of ants. All the way on the other side of the world, in England, there is a dinosaur casually walking down Balderton Gate in Newark-on-Trent. Must be the only surviving T-Rex. Scrolling further, and is that another dinosaur in the water? Let's take a closer look. Turns out it's not a dinosaur, but a giant snake skeleton off the shore of the Loire River in France. It looks different day to day depending on weather conditions and tide levels. And no, real snakes don't have skeletons like this. This is how the Chinese artist who created it saw the serpent. Let's visit Africa again. What is this giant spiral on the ground? Could it be a secret message or maybe a portal? The ancient Egyptians probably left it centuries ago. In fact, it's an art installation called Desert Breath from 2007. The artwork covers 1 million square feet. The idea was to celebrate the desert as a state of mind. Hey, my mind has been a desert for years. Off the coast of Sudan, there's one of the largest shipwrecks you can find on Google Earth. It's a Bolivian cargo ferry that sank in 2003. Let's go further east. There are about 260 mysterious stone triangles in Saudi Arabia. They point toward a bullseye also made of stone. If you scroll a bit further, you can also notice desert gates with two thick walls. The purpose of the gates is still a mystery. Are those huge weird wheels on the ground? The ones in Jordan are all different in design. Some of them have spokes positioned in such a way to align with the sunrise on the winter solstice. Scientists believe the wheels in the Black Desert were built around 8,500 years ago. When flying over Kerala, India, you can't miss a huge vulture. It's the largest bird sculpture in the world, as tall as a bowling lane and as long as the height of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The name of the bird is Jatayu, and it symbolizes the protection of women, their honor and safety. Next point, let's zoom in on it. This tiny island lies in a crater lake on an island called Volcano Island in Lake Tal, on the Luzon Island in the Philippines. There's another island in a lake on an island in a lake on an island in Canada's Nunavut territory that is thought to be the largest in the world. No human has set foot here, and it even has no name. It was discovered by Google Earth fans. The coldest, driest, and windiest continent of Antarctica must be hiding some mysteries too, like this cute creature off Zacheli Station. Could it be a giant extinct megalodon? It was the largest fish that ever lived, about three times as big as the largest sharks in the ocean today. 
Scientists found their fossils off the coast of every continent except Antarctica. So this could be a groundbreaking discovery if it turns out to be a real one. Hey, looks like there's another sea monster north off Antarctica. Could this black hole be Kraken himself? It used to scare sailors off the coasts of Norway and Greenland. So it probably moved to Antarctica over the centuries that it hadn't been seen. It had been probably inspired by a giant squid, so nothing is impossible with this one. Some locations on Google Earth are blurred for different reasons. Like this one, the Yard of Orange Trees in Almeria, Spain. There's an administration office and a courthouse in the rectangular yard. The first orange trees were planted here in the 15th century. You can visit the yard in person, but can't see it on Google Earth. It's not clear why Google decided to blur Kos International Airport on the Greek island of Kos. It's a popular tourist attraction that gets plenty of visitors, especially during the summer months. Half of Morurora Island in French Polynesia is clear, and the other half is blurred. You can't visit either of the parts anyways, as it used to be a place for nuclear tests. Sandy Island off the coast of Australia has been blurred out on Google Maps since 2012. It was discovered by Captain James Cook back in the late 1700s and could be seen on maps for 200 years. Then, Australian scientists set on a voyage to find it. All they saw was open water instead of an island the size of Manhattan. It must have been a mistake of cartographers who had first put it on the map. Oops. Ah, you're on the grass, looking up at the blue sky, enjoying some singing birds and catching some rays. You watch different shaped clouds soaring slowly, high up in the air. Suddenly, you hear a powerful loud rumble coming from far away. You get up and notice a gigantic thick cloud ahead. But it's not the size that scares you, it's the shape. The cloud looks like a skull. Eh, don't worry, it doesn't mean anything bad's gonna happen. Anyway, it's not even a cloud. A few years ago, a skull formed out of thick smoke over Mount Vesuvius in Italy. That's the same volcano that erased the ancient city of Pompeii from the face of the Earth. Of course, back then, many people were afraid that the volcano would erupt again. Luckily for everyone, the volcano's still in a deep sleep. It was just a nearby forest fire that caused the famous skull cloud. But the locals weren't so sure. Some thought that the fire and the skull were set on purpose. Eh, wouldn't be the first time. Centralia, Pennsylvania. Population, well, just look around. Looks a little scary. Bare trees, no animals, no strewn with gravel. No cars, obviously. Thick smoke everywhere. This town's been burning for more than 50 years. Centralia used to be a mining town. One of its coal mines was abandoned, and locals used it as a dump for their trash. Then, according to most people, the city decided to get rid of the trash in the usual way, by burning it. The plan was a major failure. Hmm, let's see what could have possibly gone wrong here. The trash fire got deep into the mine's tunnels, ignited the coal that's still down there, and has been burning steadily ever since. The level of carbon dioxide shot up, and they had to shut down the other mines nearby for safety. No one could stop the fire, and the underground flames spread beneath the city. Roads began to warm up, the soil went sour, and the streets slowly filled with smoke and smog. In 2017, there were only five people living there. Welcome to Abraham Lake in Canada. It's completely frozen. You step onto the transparent ice and look down at what lies beneath. No fish, just some mysterious frozen bubbles. They look like small clouds frozen in ice, or jellyfish who forgot to pack a winter jacket. There are thousands of these little bubbles made up of methane. But don't try to dig a hole in the ice to touch it. Methane is highly flammable. It's created by methane-producing bacteria that eats leaves, grass, insects, and any other organic stuff that gets into the lake. When the methane touches the frozen water, it turns into tens of thousands of frozen little balls. When the ice melts, they burst open and sizzle. If you lit a match over them at just the right moment, the lake would look kind of like an erupting volcano. Similar lakes can be found near some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times the size of hot air balloons. Beautiful for sure, but not exactly safe. 
The next shocking lake is in Indonesia, on the island of Java. You come to a majestic volcano overgrown with grass and trees. The volcano seems to be asleep, but smoke is pouring out of it. You, of course, climb to the summit. Exhausted, tired, sweaty, you're ready to cool off. Nice work, you made it to the top. You look into the mouth of the volcano. Hmm, no boiling lava, just a beautiful, bright, turquoise lake down there. It looks like an oasis. Perfect time for a refreshing dip. You run down and get ready to jump in. But that's not water, that's acid. Sulfurous gases get into the lake from under the volcano. The lake itself is full of metals. When the gases touch them, they form that beautiful turquoise water, I mean acid. Better head back to the nearest village, rest and come back at night when it's cooler. In the dark, the lake seems to grow. Right above it, you see light-filled exploding little clouds. The sulfurous gases rise out of the lake, combine with the air, and flash bright blue. Still, don't get too close. Up in the sky, underground, volcanoes, lakes? Hmm. Time to head out to sea. You get on a yacht and sail off. It doesn't matter where, this next one happens all over the world. So, the sea is crystal clear and calm, there's no wind in your sails. Everything is so peaceful. Wait, what's that? You hear a loud, loud noise. Two seconds later, a huge wave, way taller than your mast, rises from the calm sea and hits your yacht. The ship manages to stay upright, and the huge wave disappears. You just survived the attack of a rogue wave. Some scientists think it happens when the surface sea current smashes into a strong headwind. Others say it happens when warm and cold currents come up against each other. Another popular theory is wave interference, where small waves team up to form one monster one. Under certain conditions, waves get a sort of superpower. Out of all the waves in the area, there'll be one which sucks the energy out of all the others. When it's full, the wave spits it all out. Maybe that's why the wave's so strong, but only lasts an instant. What about clouds? Scary? Well, they can be, if they're huge thunderclouds, walls of gray and black blocking out the sun, the moon, and the stars. First, you're relaxing in your backyard, then you see thunderclouds. Then you get thunderstorms, hail, floods, and even tornadoes. They're easy to spot thanks to their epic appearance. Thick, heavy, and dark. They can even sparkle inside because of lightning. That's one scary-looking cloud. But before you run away, let's see how it forms. Clouds are like roller coasters. Imagine you're a small drop of water hanging out with your friends in the ocean, waiting in line for the brand new ride that just opened up. It's time. You strap in. Nothing happens. Then you feel it. The roller coaster starts to go up, up, up. You can see all your droplet friends down there. They're so small. You keep rising, just waiting for the big whoosh. But nothing happens. Then you're so high up that you're in the clouds. It's not so scary up here, and there are loads of your friends. <laughs> nice. It's starting to get cold. You look around. It's happening to everyone. You're being turned into beautiful ice crystals. So shiny and pretty. The clouds filling up, getting kind of cramped with all those other water droplets. Still, what a peaceful, enjoyable, wow! The ride kicks back in and you start to free fall. Slowly at first, then faster and faster, thousands of your fellow drops falling back to earth, some holding on tight to the handrail, some laughing and waving their hands in the air. Woohoo! And splash! Still, I like the lightning ride better. That's one where they strap you in, you ride up, and then you play bumper cars way up in the clouds. The more times you bump into another water droplet, the more lightning you create. Now, not all lightning happens inside clouds. There's a rare phenomenon called a dirty thunderstorm. The lightning happens above a volcano. The most famous is in Japan. It erupts almost every day and spits black clouds high into the air. So, it's super scary volcano clouds, plus lightning. Whoa. Regular lightning happens during a storm when ice crystals bump into each other. In a dirty thunderstorm, bits of volcanic ash collide, create friction, and spark up the sky. 
Okay, better finish the journey with something safe and beautiful. No more cloud roller coasters, please. You're in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, one of the driest places on Earth. But this desert has a beautiful secret. Every three to five years, flowers pop up out of nowhere. It's so famous, it's also called the flowering desert. Seeds lie around in the ground, just waiting for some rain. When the desert gets enough water, about 200 types of flowers sprout up. The yellow sands of the Atacama turn purple, white, green, and pink. So, you notice anything weird? Recently, there have been alarming changes in the water levels in different parts of Yellowstone Lake. At the same moment, the water level can be rising on one side of the lake and falling on the other. Ooh, it looks as if the lake basin gets lifted by some underground forces. Can it be a sign of a looming disaster? Geysers, mud pots, and hot springs turn Yellowstone National Park into some extraterrestrial world. And all these wonders are fueled by a mighty supervolcano. Supervolcanoes produce super eruptions. When it happens, they launch more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. To make it easier to imagine, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. The Yellowstone giant was thought to be responsible for at least three enormous eruptions and countless smaller ones. In that region, the volcanic deposits are scattered over tens of thousands of miles. Scientists believe they had been created by many weak eruptions. But after doing more research, experts found out these deposits had been left by two previously unknown super eruptions. Those probably took place about 9 and 8.7 million years ago. This discovery means that the area around the Yellowstone volcano used to face a super eruption every half a million years. But over the last three million years, the hotspot has seen only two super eruptions. It makes scientists believe these catastrophic events are slowing down. Or just maybe one is overdue. Anyway, if the Yellowstone supervolcano went off with as much power as it had 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of boiling lava. That's more than 4,500 times the volume of Sydney Harbor. That's a lot of lava. Whether it's likely to happen or not is another question. There's no doubt that something is going on with the volcano. The water level changes in Yellowstone Lake mean the caldera is lifting under the surface. And the caldera is what's left over after a volcano erupts and then collapses. The Yellowstone caldera is not just going up, creating a dome-shaped uplift. It also moves up and down in a kind of breathing motion. It might be because the magma is seeping into the crust, or because this magma is heating up the Yellowstone hydrothermal system, making it expand and raise the crust. Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano. Its volcanic explosivity index is 8 out of 10. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. Right before the disaster, the ground around the national park would lift. Geothermal pools and geysers would heat up to boiling temperatures and get more acidic than usual. The magma would start to rise toward the surface. At some point, the rock roof of the magma chamber wouldn't be able to resist anymore, and the explosion would kick off. A massive column of lava and ash would shoot up to a height of over 16 miles. After that, the volcano would keep pumping ash for days on end. The mixture of lava, ash, and gas would be hotter than 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. It would travel through the area at a speed of 300 miles per hour, faster than a racing car. The air near the center of the eruption would heat up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the most dangerous consequences would be ash fallout. Volcanic ash can turn into glassy cement within seconds after being inhaled and getting in the lungs. People and animals would have problems with breathing. Okay, so that's an understatement, just so you know. Buildings would start to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It would take just several days until a 10-foot layer of ash covered the territory of about 50 miles around the center of the eruption. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world would start to drop. 
If the eruption was rich in sulfur, an effective sunblocker, it would get so cold there would be no summer in the entire world for the next several years. The monsoon seasons would change. Agriculture would face serious problems. There would be issues with food supplies. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost two feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5 to 15%. The probability of the eruption is 1 in 730,000. Safe to say, it's a long shot. Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hotspot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. Still, there have been tons of discussions about what people could do to prevent the disastrous supereruption from happening. And the most popular and seemingly effective idea was to cool the Yellowstone supervolcano down. Unfortunately, there's a catch. The volcano leaks out only 70% of the heat which comes from its magma-filled chambers. But the rest of the heat stays inside. As soon as it reaches a particular threshold, the volcano erupts. If it was possible to extract at least 35% of the Yellowstone volcano's heat, the eruption could be avoided. The cooler the magma is, the thicker and stickier it gets. It stops being so fluid and doesn't try to get out to the surface anymore. After considering these facts, NASA scientists came up with a plan. They suggested drilling a six miles deep well and pumping down cold, pressurized water. The temperature of the water that would get back to the surface would be approximately 662 degrees Fahrenheit. This way, the heat would be gradually extracted from the volcano. And if a geothermal plant was built on the site, it would generate plenty of electric power. It would be very simple to produce, and its price would be very alluring – about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. At first glance, it was an amazing idea. But sometime later, it started to receive a lot of criticism. Imagine drilling through the Earth's crust, getting deeper and deeper, and then wham bam, you hit a hypothermal pocket. Uh-oh, get ready for a catastrophe. This can release gases that are likely to cause a series of super powerful explosions. In the worst case scenario, it may even trigger a full-scale volcanic eruption. Now, you already know about its catastrophic outcomes. From fountains of lava and avalanches of molten rocks to climate changes all over the globe. Yeah, not good. Or let's say you're drilling a well to deliver cold water to the volcano. And then you suddenly hit its magma chamber. In this case, instead of cooling the giant down, you'll make the top of the magma chamber much more fragile than it used to be. And the whole construction will be at risk of collapsing at any moment. And don't forget that your drilling may also release toxic gases. They often accumulate at the top of the reservoir with magma. Can it get any worse? Well, yes it can! The whole process would stretch for more than 16,000 years. This method is too risky to cool the volcano down as fast as people would probably want. And scientists aren't even 100% sure that when the cooling system construction is finished, the volcano will stay cold for at least another 100 years. And last but not least, the project of making the Yellowstone supervolcano a bit cooler would cost a mind-boggling $3.5 billion. A huge price for something that might not work out altogether. Oh, by the way, Yellowstone isn't the only volcano that has a lava dome that's lifting at the moment. Lava domes are created when magma gets to the surface and then gathers around the vent. Scientists have found one of those inside an underwater volcano in Japan. This dome is more than 2,000 feet high and more than 6 miles wide. Even though the Japanese supervolcano seems to be sleeping, experts don't let their guard down. A volcanic system can go from being calm and docile to teetering on the edge of an eruption in the blink of an eye. Another massive dome is growing in the central Andes, on top of the planet's largest active magma store. The Altiplano Puna Plateau well, there's a tongue twister, and where the dome was found is the second highest plateau in the world, and the dome itself is more than half a mile tall. 
You might wonder how come experts have known nothing about this enormous uplift until recently. The answer is simple. It was hidden within the plateau. It's an arid region littered with volcanoes, and it stretches for thousands of miles. Yep, another case of hiding in plain sight. It happened in Iceland on Friday, March 19, 2021, at 8.45 p.m., about 20 miles southwest of the capital. Molten rock suddenly burst through the surface from below. Bright lava fountains then lit up the night sky. A volcano in this valley finally woke up after almost 800 years of sleeping soundly. We divide volcanoes into three categories – active, dormant, or extinct. Around 1,900 of them around the globe are considered active. That means they've erupted in the recent past and will likely do it again in the possible near future. Dormant volcanoes haven't popped off for a long time, but they still may in the future. You could say they're sort of sleeping. As for extinct ones, those guys haven't done anything in more than a million years. The eruption in Iceland wasn't super explosive, and this all happened 6 miles from the nearest town. So everyone was perfectly safe. Many even came to see it up close. While other brave visitors tried to fry eggs and bacon on the lava. Just be careful not to burn your breakfast black. Lava can be over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It burns everything in its path. Yet it also produces some of the most fertile land for agriculture. This eruption gave a relatively small amount of lava at first. But it's been spreading across the valley in different directions, forming a sort of shield that's constantly growing. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can ooze slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous thing about volcanoes. That would be the toxic gases spewing from the eruption. And those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Luckily, in Iceland's case, the wind has been blowing these gases away from residential areas. Scientists weren't surprised this volcano erupted. They knew it was coming. Increasingly stronger earthquakes had been shaking this area for the past 15 months. There were 50,000 earthquakes within just the three weeks leading up to the eruption. That's 100 per hour. The volcano has been active since March. And geologists say this could last for weeks, months, years, or even decades of constant eruptions in the area. Mount Shasta is in the top five most dangerous volcanoes in the U.S. So geologists are keeping a close eye on it. The last eruption was in 1250. I wasn't around then. But this volcano erupts every 600 to 800 years. Which means, tick-tock, we're due any day now. About an hour from Portland, Oregon, there's an active volcano that last erupted in the 19th century. Next time it goes off, scientists think it'll produce larger amounts of ash and dust. This could cause an electrical blackout and make water unsafe to drink in the area. But the experts pay close attention to Mount Hood. They'll be able to give plenty of warning so people can react in time. Kilauea is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's been erupting almost constantly since 1983, making it also one of the longest eruptions known on Earth. It's the youngest land volcano in Hawaii. Volcanoes can take thousands of years to form, but others can pop up practically overnight. A volcano in Mexico just erupted in an open field in 1943 and started growing from there. Within a year, it was almost 1,500 feet tall. When the eruptions finally stopped nine years later, the mount had reached a height of over 9,200 feet. Mount Fuji is an iconic symbol of Japan. The last time it erupted was in 1707, and it sent a shower of burning rocks as far as 60 miles away. If a similar eruption happened today, Tokyo would be within that vicinity. Mount Fuji is right on the Ring of Fire, 
that horseshoe-shaped region in the Pacific Ocean full of active volcanoes and earthquakes. From one end to the other, it's almost 25,000 miles long. It could wrap all the way around the Earth's equator. In January 2020, tall volcano in the Philippines started spewing lava, sending huge plumes of ash half a mile up into the sky. The eruption even triggered a rare phenomenon, a dirty thunderstorm. That's when the smoke cloud above a volcano produces its own lightning. The chance of volcanic tsunamis was also high. Those are usually caused by tectonic movements that occur because of volcanic activity. Tall has erupted more than 30 times in the last 450 years. This volcano in Ecuador last erupted in 2016. Scientists think it might be showing some early warning signs of magma on the move. This is an active stratovolcano, a specific cone-shaped type with steep sides. They form from sticky lava that doesn't flow that easily. That lava goes around the vent, cooling and piling on itself to form these steep walls. These types are more likely to produce explosive eruptions like the ones we see in movies. Ruapehu is the oldest national park in New Zealand, a volcanic wonderland where you can closely see all those steaming craters, magnificent lakes, and unusual rock formations. It last erupted in 2007 and has had 10 eruptions since the mid-19th century. But eruptions, lava flows, and toxic gases aren't the only danger coming from volcanoes. There's also a thing called lahar, a kind of volcanic mud flow of debris. In between eruptions, snow melts and a lake forms in the caldera. If the last eruption brought mud, ash, and rocks in the lake, it becomes dangerously full. In that case, only a temporary dam holds it back. Indonesia has the biggest number of active volcanoes in the world, including one called Anak Krakatoa. It means child of Krakatoa, and its famous parent isn't far away. A huge tsunami in 2018 partially woke Junior, a scary thought since Senior had one of the most powerful eruptions ever seen on this planet in 1883. Krakatoa's boom was the loudest sound ever heard. People over 2,000 miles away could hear the explosion. The sound wave circled the globe seven times. And scientists say it's hard to predict this volcano's eruption patterns. Mount Yasur in Vanuatu is one of just a few volcanoes in the world where you can see a lava lake. Tourists even go there to peer over the edge and get a look at the burning, bubbling lake below. Well, except for when the volcanic activity goes to levels 3 and 4 out of 5, that means there are more intense earthquakes, volcanic tremors, or steam, gas, or ash ejections. Then this place is off-limits because, duh! This volcano in the DR Congo has the most active and largest lake volcano in the world. And all that lava is unusually fluid meaning it travels faster and further than the stuff coming out of most volcanoes. It's certainly not amongst the tallest ones, but Ethiopia's Erta Ali is unique in that it has a lava lake almost constantly, which is pretty rare. The locals call it a smoking mountain because its lava lake often causes eruptions. This volcano is near the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on our planet. Marupi has been erupting on a regular basis since the mid-16th century. This volcano helps scientists do crucial research on how eruptions work and how they can warn people in time. After it was dormant for a while, this volcano in central Mexico sprang back to life in 1994. Ever since then, it's been producing huge mud flows and strong explosions in unpredictable intervals. In the past, enormous eruptions coming from this giant buried entire cities in pyramids. Imagine staying in a hotel and waking up to the magnificent view of a massive volcano covered in glowing rivers of lava and clouds of ash. When it lets off heat, visitors to this area in Guatemala take a chance to roast some marshmallows there. One of the most active volcanoes on Earth is on a small island north of Sicily. Stromboli has regular explosions, together with glowing lava coming from vents inside the crater. 
Not too far away is Etna, Europe's most active volcano and one of the biggest continental ones in the world. By the way, Earth definitely isn't the only planet with volcanoes. The largest one in our solar system is on Mars. It would cover the entire state of Arizona, and it rises nearly three times higher than Mount Everest. Ooh, don't look down. Ah, Kiev. You've been dreaming of getting here for years. Getting out your trusty camera, you start taking pictures of the cathedrals, aviation museum, and the Dnipro River. When, without warning, there's an enormous boom behind you. Turning around, you see something towering in the distance. It looks like a gigantic explosion. Uh-oh, time to leave fast! In June 2020, what the people of Kiev were looking at was an anvil cloud, a rare storm formation in the sky. Forming when strong air currents carry water vapor upwards, the air expands and spreads out as it hits the bottom of the stratosphere. It pushes the dense cloud into the cool anvil shape you see, and sometimes it even gets to be a mushroom. Anvil clouds produce some of the most dangerous lightning of all storms, one that's called a bolt out of the blue. This lightning strike seems to magically come out of the blue sky with the storm being many miles away. This type of bolt comes from the top of the anvil and can be 10 times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. People got so frightened after witnessing a giant cloud just 60 miles away, thinking something terrible must have happened. The locals had pictures of the large billow on social media before officials could explain what was going on. Authorities managed to calm everyone's fears by informing them it was nothing more than a natural phenomenon, and a beautiful one at that. Before dissipating, these clouds typically stay in one area, regardless of how strong the wind is. Touring around the northern tip of Queensland, Australia, way away from those creepy crawlies, it's time to take a break and relax at the beach. Getting comfortable, you notice a great big shadow passes over you, then another, and yet another. Looking up, this weird weather is simply stunning. The clouds are called morning glory, a very rare type of cloud that almost seems to roll across the sky, looking like a massive tube. These clouds can measure up to 600 miles long, even appearing in large groups as well. This phenomenon is the result of an updraft pushing through the cloud, creating a rolling appearance, while moist cooler air at the back causes them to sink downward. Southern India between July and September 2001. People witnessed one of the strangest weather phenomenon in recorded history. The rain was red. What many would have thought to be a typical rainstorm left them shocked. The color was bright enough to stain clothes. There were other colors too, such as green, yellow, brown, and even black. In the middle of a monsoon, red rain started to fall and did so periodically for several weeks. Researchers have found this unusual rain is stained either by dust or algae, so don't try to catch any on your tongue. Scientists aren't entirely sure how the algae got all the way up there. This does make events like this a little unsettling. Like to take a bubble bath to relax after an exhausting day, but taking too long to fill the bathtub? Problem solved! Head to any coastline after a big storm and take a dip. Foamy tides aren't native to any one place or location. They can be formed anywhere in the world. They're most likely to happen along rocky coastlines, like the coast of San Francisco, Northern Ireland, or the Mooloolaba, Australia. Each coast has differing conditions forming the sea foams. If you scoop up seawater into a glass and look at it closely, you'll see it's full of tiny particles. Many things like plants, chemicals, and lots of salt and minerals create the perfect formula for foam. When powerful currents and wind mix it all together, we get something that resembles a cappuccino top floating on top of the water. When freezing temperatures hit orchards in Michigan, all kinds of unusual things happen. Like ghost apples. No, they're not going to scare you at all. But if you plan on sneaking away one winter to find one, 
Be warned! Everything has to be perfect for this to occur, and it's going to be freezing cold. This is actually a rare weather phenomenon caused by having the apples freeze where they are with rain coating the fruit in a thin layer of ice. The apples then thaw and leak out like applesauce, leaving just the beautiful ice shell behind. The Catatumbo River in Venezuela might be the most electric place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days per year. The lightning storms are so consistent, they're predicted for three months in advance. During the wet season in October, you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute, a truly shocking experience. With each bolt having the energy to power a single light bulb for six months, the impressive display could power all of Venezuela forever. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. As the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, it produces the static charges that cause the lightning storms nearly every night. If that wasn't bad enough, some storms have lightning above them as well. Try to take a picture of this one. Jellyfish lightning sprites are electrical discharges high in Earth's atmosphere. They're associated with powerful thunderstorms, but they have nothing to do with rain. These sprites occur 30 to 50 miles up in the sky, in the mesosphere. Artificial lights at night make it a lot harder to see this faint lightning. If you spot one, it'll look tiny, but can be well over 30 miles wide. The red sprites are a type of cold plasma discharge above a thundercloud. They're the balance of the lightning charges between the storm clouds and the ground below. Don't try to find this type of donut at your favorite bakery. It won't be there. Snow donuts are one of the rarest meteorological sights to see, with perfect weather conditions needed just to create them. Found in any snow-covered mountain area, like the Rocky Mountains, the wind, temperature, snow, ice, and moisture have to all work together for us to see these phenomenal rings. A thin layer of wet snow on the ground. Under that layer, ice or powdered snow. Then, a strong enough breeze to roll the donut down a hill, just like a snowball. Once it stops rolling, it can be the size of a baseball or as large as a car tire. It all depends on how strong the wind is. A newly formed snow donut won't stay around for very long, so hurry up with that camera! Watching the sunset over the horizon, the beautiful purples and pink overhead are nothing compared to the three suns you see in front of you. Wow, since when did Earth get three suns? These phantom stars sometimes appearing beside the sun are called sun dogs. Maybe they're called that because they're kind of dogging the actual sun? <laughs> sun dogs often appear as colored areas of light at the same height above the horizon as the sun. They're mostly observed on a ring or halo, where ice crystals best reflect the light. There are also moon dogs that appear alongside the moon and are formed by lunar light passing through ice crystals, though these aren't seen nearly as much as their daytime partners. Taking photos in the wild, you finally found the perfect spot to take that dream shot. The crystal clear water, the pines, the mountains, and the flying saucer. Wait, a flying saucer? Oh, aliens are here! <clears throat> you might be thinking this if you saw a saucer-shaped cloud. I'm not even going to try to pronounce their name, though. Put that on the screen, please. Wait, just kidding. It's Alto Cumulus Lenticularis. Aren't you impressed? These are really just unusual cloud formations over mountaintops. When moist air flows over a mountain, a wave is created if the temperature difference is perfect. As the air passes through the wave, evaporation occurs and a series of these clouds may form into an oval shape. Not aliens at all. Whew. The sky is falling! The sky is falling! Well, people who have experienced these clouds say they look like they're coming down from the sky. Mammatus clouds look like giant white lumpy marshmallows, but it might be hard to toast these ones. 
these weird, fluffy clouds can extend hundreds of miles in any direction, remaining visible for short periods at the bottom of anvil or other thunderstorm clouds. The strange bubble shapes are formed from turbulence within the storm itself, creating an uneven cloud base and appearing anywhere in the world. Mammatus clouds form when moist air sinks into dry air. The air must be cooler than its surroundings, cooled with ice, or be heavy with water. When you think of a volcano, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Streams of red, steaming hot lava pouring over the sides? Dark clouds of ash rising high into the sky? Maybe you think of a relaxing hot spring. Ah, that's nice. Well, we all imagine one thing. A cone-shaped mountain looming over the horizon. But it can be as green and lush as any other mountain. At the top, of course, there's a giant hole. Like an opening that goes all the way down. Inside, there's lava and gases being pushed outside. Lava is so hot that if you were standing at the top of the volcano and looked down, your face would feel as red as the color of that liquid rock oozing out. A volcanic eruption never comes without consequences for us. And I'm not just talking about people living nearby. The impacts are usually felt on a global scale, too. Can't fly for a while because of the blanket of ash released in the air. Not to mention, it might be a bit tricky to breathe. Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and plenty of other toxic gases whose names immediately take you back to your high school chemistry class. Funny enough, most of that cloud rising out of a volcano is just water. Well, vaporized from those scalding temperatures. But before any volcano erupts, it goes through stages like an angsty teen. First, magma that's lava before it erupts onto the surface and gets its name change, starts moving underneath the volcano. This causes earthquakes that get worse and more dangerous over time. Then, steam and different gases start spewing out of holes in the planet's crust. Our Earth resembles a tea kettle about to whistle. When the gas emissions and earthquakes get more massive, it usually means the volcano is about to blow its top. But those first stages can take years before an eruption happens. Then, the magma starts building up. With more and more pressure, it's planning to make its great escape. It's hard to notice this happening if you don't have the proper equipment. Good thing scientists do, and they've got us covered. The volcano becomes more active by the minute. Ash starts coming out and spreading in the air, creating ominous clouds that turn day to night. With the magma building up, an eruption is imminent. Then, boom! The surface gives in under the pressure below. The magma makes its exit. It's now lava spewing out the top and flowing down the sides of the mountain. None of this sounds very appealing. So what if it never happened? What if there were never any volcanoes at all? Would Earth still be the same? Not at all. If volcanoes never existed, there wouldn't be an atmosphere. When our planet was still just a young pup, volcanic gases are what created our protective bubble that allows you and me to breathe right now. They also played a big part in shaping the land and oceans. Four billion years ago, Earth was still forming. It didn't look anything like the pale blue dot we know today. It was red hot, and the water was trapped under the crust. It wasn't until the surface started to cool down and solidify that the water was finally able to escape. Volcanoes acted sort of like a tear in the fabric of our planet. Water vapor would condense in the atmosphere and then fall back down as rain. It rained for so long that the third planet from the sun started turning into the blue ball we're more familiar with. In fact, there's even a theory that all the water on Earth came from volcanoes. And without water, of course, life wouldn't have been able to form. Land formation went through a similar process. You see, our planet was a pretty rough place to be when it was forming. It was a molten surface, with fields of lava and constant volcanic eruptions and space rocks always crashing into it, because there was no atmosphere to protect it. When it started cooling down, a good solid surface formed. But the hot material underneath was still boiling and bubbling, and it continued making its way up. 
the crust would move and form thick layers with the material that was rising up. Over time, these layers became more permanent. Volcanic eruptions were still happening, but the first landmass had finally formed. Okay, we'll take the best part of volcanoes, an atmosphere. So what if they stopped erupting long after we got our protective breathable shield? Still not good. For starters, volcanoes created the most fertile soil. Around Naples, you have the famous Mount Vesuvius. The soil quality there is incredibly rich. And that's thanks to two huge volcanic eruptions. One that happened 35,000 years ago and another 12,000 years ago. Sure, these volcanoes caused a lot of short-term damage, but in the long run, these soils were fertilized by them. Now the region grows all kinds of citrus fruits, olives, grapes, cherries, and of course, their staple, tomatoes. There'd be none of that without rich volcanic soil, and Naples is by far not the only example like this. Bacteria, the first living organisms, lived in hot water. Scientists have discovered fossilized microorganisms older than 4 billion years. They thrived in hydrothermal vents. Those are fissures on the sea floor, and they're usually near volcanically active places. This means that without volcanoes, we wouldn't have land, water, or even the first life forms that, as the theory goes, would eventually evolve into all the creatures we have today. Could life have still developed on Earth without these explosive mountains? Eh, doubtful. Okay, fair enough. We want our atmosphere and life. So let's say volcanoes stopped erupting today, after we already have all these benefits. Well, we're sort of already there, based on this story. At the start, there was only one continent, Pangaea. It was a supercontinent surrounded by one massive continuous superocean. Volcanic activity by this time had finally calmed down, and this meant all that energy would gather below the Earth's crust. Here's a little diagram. First, we have the Earth's inner core. Then there's the outer core. Next up, we have our convection currents. Magma is next in line. After that, the oceanic crust. And at the very top, we have our ocean and our continental crust. The reason Pangaea eventually broke up into the separate continents we have today is because of plate tectonics. It's not like the crust is all one solid piece. It's broken up into big chunks, or plates, that are always moving. And it's all still moving today. Yes, the land you're standing on right now is sort of surfing on that layer of convection currents. It's a slow process, so it's not like you can feel it. Pangaea didn't break apart all at once. It took tens of millions of years. When the plates move, they cause earthquakes and volcanic activity. They create mountains, too. It's good for our planet as well, because the Earth gets to sort of renew its old crust. If there was no volcanic activity now, the pressure underneath the Earth's crust would keep building up. It'd get to a boiling point the continents couldn't handle anymore. And eventually, they'd start splitting into more numerous and smaller masses. Volcanoes are still useful to us till this day. For one, they cool our atmosphere. Their eruptions release sulfur gas. It combines with water in our atmosphere and cools it at its lowest level, which is where we live and breathe. There's also an excellent use for their heat. Geothermal power plants harness the energy coming from deep inside the Earth and turn its heat into steam. We then use that steam and turn it into electricity. This is the case for our friends in New Zealand and Iceland since they live in places with high underground temperatures. Volcanic material can also be made into blocks for building stuff. It can be grounded down to make cement, too. If we want, we can even search volcanoes for precious minerals like gold, copper, and sulfur. And who can forget about hot springs? Tourism to places like Yellowstone and Iceland wouldn't be the same without them. And who doesn't love a nice steamy dip in the ones safe for swimming? Oh, yeah. In the end, volcanoes aren't so bad after all. Our beautiful Earth wouldn't be what it is without them. In Russia, on the shores of the Baltic Sea, there's an enigmatic national park. The Dancing Forest is a place that no scientist has managed to explain so far. 
The pine trees of the forest are all crooked and twisted into loops and spirals. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted in order to make the sand dune in that area more stable. One theory is that it's the unstable sand that made the trees twist in such a way. Other theories for the crooked trees are strong winds, or even supernatural powers. Some people say the forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet, twisting the trees. Local legend says that if a person climbs through one of the rings of a tree, it'll add an extra year to this person's life, or they'll be granted a wish. I like that one. Speaking of bizarre trees, and I was, one grows in the region of Piedmont, Italy. There, a cherry tree grows on the top of a mulberry tree. The strange thing is that both trees are perfectly healthy. A continuous storm at Saturn's North Pole has an odd shape, a hexagon. This is probably because of the gradient of the winds. The total length of this cloud pattern is 9,000 miles, which is about 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. The hexagon has been observed for many years, but it gets even more mysterious because it changes color too. It used to be turquoise, but it has recently shifted to a golden color. The reason for the color change is that the pole gets exposed to sunlight as the seasons change. Now, rain isn't unusual for Oakville, Washington. However, this one still doesn't have any solid scientific explanation. Instead of common raindrops, people watch translucent jelly-like blobs fall from the skies. These blobs covered about 20 square miles. Those who got really close to the rain experience flu-like symptoms. What were the blobs? Researchers claim that the blobs contain human white blood cells. Later tests showed no presence of nuclei. Some people claim the blobs might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain, or maybe even waste from a commercial plane. Walking rocks, also known as sailing rocks, move across the Death Valley National Park in California without any external intervention, leaving long trails in the dirt and sand along their way. Various time-lapse footages of the moving rocks have been taken. Scientists even installed GPS navigators on some of the rocks, and it showed that the rocks move at a considerable speed. Some researchers believe that the movement is due to thin sheets of ice that form overnight at freezing temperatures in the valley, letting the rocks move until it melts during the day. Or there was a Rolling Stones concert. Nah. The Batageka crater in Siberia looks like a doorway to the underworld. It's about a half mile long and over 280 feet deep, but it never stops growing. As it gets deeper, it exposes more underground layers. The layers show what our planet looked like thousands of years ago, as the slumps reveal the used-to-be climates. The crater appeared back in the 60s, and it all started with rapid deforestation. Trees no longer cast shade on the ground, and it got hotter. The permafrost melted, resulting in the crater formation. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals wild since the 1990s. The low-frequency hum deprives people of sleep and depletes their energy. Even though scientists have tried to find the source of the hum, they still haven't pinpointed its origin. Different variations of the hum have also been heard in the UK, Australia, Canada, and other areas of the US. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. The hums have been blamed on mechanical devices, multiple disturbances of auditory systems, and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was blamed on toadfish. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are mysterious rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. There's a lot of debate about why these fungi form a nearly perfect circle. Some superstitions claim that fairy dances would burn the ground, causing mushrooms to rapidly grow. In Costa Rica, there's an assortment of about 300 spherical stone balls. Locals call them las bolas, which is simply the balls in English. These stones have an almost perfect round shape. Some of them are huge, weighing up to 16 tons each. They're also made of different materials – gabbro, limestone, and sandstone. They're considered to have been put in straight lines in front of the chief's houses. 
but there's no precise information of their origin. Some myths claim that these stones originated in Atlantis. Mm. If you ever travel to the Mekong River in late October, you have a chance of seeing glowing balls rising from the water and beelining up into the air. Locals call these glowing balls the Naga Fireballs. The size of the lights vary. The reddish balls can be as tiny as a spark and as large as a basketball. There can be dozens to thousands of balls a night. Scientists don't have any solid explanation for why it happens, but it could be due to flammable gases released by the marshy environment. Some superstitious locals are sure it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Great balls of fire! In Minnesota, on the north shore of Lake Superior, there's a park known for the Devil's Kettle. This is a waterfall that splits in two. One part of the river continues, while the other part disappears into a hole in the ground. Whatever object you throw into the Devil's Kettle won't reappear. Scientists still haven't fully explained where the water that drops into the hole goes. Devil's Kettle is considered to be unsafe for people because it's nearly impossible to trace the flow. Yeah, not a place to go tubing. Grunions are fish known for their bizarre mating ritual. The females climb out of the water and onto the shore. They dig their tails into the sand in order to lay eggs. The legs stay hidden in the sand, waiting. Ten days later, the high tide comes, washing the newly hatched young to the sea. Scientists still can't give any solid explanation for this way of breeding. People who live in rural central Norway over the Hestalen Valley can often witness floating lights of white, yellow, and red cross the sky. The lights appear both at day and night, and once back in the 80s, they were spotted 15 to 20 times in a single week. The Hestalen lights can last just a few seconds, but sometimes they can last more than an hour. The lights move, seeming to float or even sway around. Some scientists believe that the reason for these lights is due to ionized iron dust. Others say it's combustion that includes sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. Many people claim they're just misidentified aircrafts. Yellowstone Park has a famous boiling lake, but it's not the world's only place of boiling water. Deep in the Amazon, there's the 4-mile Chanay Tempishka River that's always hot. The name means boiled by the sun. Well, it's not exactly boiling, but it can reach 196 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cook pasta. Ooh, let's try that. The lowest temperature in these waters is about 113 degrees. This river still can't be scientifically explained because it would require close proximity to a volcano for the water to reach such temperatures. However, the closest volcano is 400 miles away. But there could be a fault between the Earth that could explain this phenomenon. In western Venezuela, locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did once stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Speaking of lightning, I got a bolt. Bye! You feel some rumbling from below. No, it's not your tummy. It's low and ominous. You look up and see strange lights hanging above the ground. They look like shimmering balls of light hovering high up in the sky. Your throat goes dry, and you gulp. That's what they call the earthquake lights. This phenomenon is poorly understood, but witnesses say they've seen it in different shapes and sizes. It could be in the form of light balls, sheet lightning, streamers, and a steady glow in the sky. Soon after, a strong earthquake follows. Scientists can't explain why those lights appear, and they don't always do either. Some believe that's a reaction of underground gases released into the atmosphere. Sure enough, an earthquake begins. But lucky you, it's not as strong as you expected. The ground is shaking, but you even manage to keep your balance. It stops as abruptly as it began, and you walk home. On the way home, you see a flash and hear a whip crack. 
lightning has struck a lone tree near where you just stood. It's caught on fire, and there's a column of flames rising to the sky. Still no rain, and the pillar becomes taller and taller. Have you heard of such a thing as a fire tornado? These phenomena occur when the wind is caught in a circle close to the ground because of the difference in air pressure. Such mini tornadoes are usually easy to notice. Small rubble, dust, sand, and leaves rise into the air and start flying in rapid circles. But then, if there's a source of fire nearby, the funnel can catch it and blow it stronger like bellows. The flames go round and round, reaching ever higher and eventually creating a swirling, blazing tower. Luckily, fire tornadoes are short-lived and don't normally cause much damage. But don't try to hide from the storm under that tree. You can find this unusual plant in Florida and in some parts of the Caribbean coast. Externally, it doesn't look special at all. A great trunk, green leaves, and fruit similar to small apples. What you must remember is never to pluck these apples and never stand next to the tree, especially if it's raining. This is the manchineel tree, which is considered the most dangerous in the world. Its trunk, bark, branches, and fruit contain poisonous juice. One drop of this corrosive acidic liquid can harm your skin a lot. The tree can secrete this juice, and if you accidentally touch it, you risk burning your hand. When it rains, water droplets fall on the tree and mix with the poison. Water can also bounce off the bark and get on your skin. That's why you shouldn't stand nearby either. There are almost no other shrubs or mushrooms growing around. Animals avoid these trees, and people don't chop them and don't pluck the fruit. You can't make a bonfire from their branches. Burning wood emits poisonous smoke that can damage your eyes. Locals know this tree well, but tourists and travelers might accidentally get harmed. That's why most manchineel trees are marked with paint or have a warning sign. In western Venezuela, Locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did one stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Not all lightning happens inside clouds. There's a rare phenomenon called a dirty thunderstorm. The lightning happens above a volcano. The most famous is in Japan. It erupts almost every day and spits black clouds high into the air. So it's super scary volcano clouds plus lightning. Whoa! Regular lightning happens during a storm when ice crystals bump into each other. In a dirty thunderstorm, bits of volcanic ash collide, create friction, and spark up the sky. In the hottest and one of the driest places on Earth, Africa's Donakil Desert, temperatures often rise above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The out-of-this-world landscape has many active volcanoes and geysers that spit out toxic gases like chlorine and sulfur. The vibrantly green, electric blue, and yellow waters are all rain and seawater warmed up by magma. One wrong step here, and you'd be gone for good. This happened in June 2009. People in certain areas in Japan left their homes after a heavy downpour, only to find fish, frogs, and tadpoles everywhere. Fields, roads, lawns, and rooftops were littered with these aquatic creatures. One man was shocked to see 13 carp on and around his truck. Apparently, he stopped to count them. No one knows for sure where the bizarre rain came from, but the most popular theory claims that a powerful water spout picked up all these creatures. Then it carried them through the upper atmosphere and dropped the animals on the unsuspecting people below. And now, welcome to Abraham Lake in Canada. It's completely frozen. You step onto the transparent ice and look down at what lies beneath. No fish, just some mysterious frozen bubbles. They look like small clouds frozen in ice, or jellyfish who forgot to pack a winter jacket. There are thousands of these little bubbles made up of methane. But don't try to dig a hole in the ice to touch it. Methane is highly flammable. It's created by methane-producing bacteria 
that eats leaves, grass, insects, or any other organic stuff that gets into the lake. When the methane touches the frozen water, it turns into tens of thousands of frozen little balls. When the ice melts, they burst open and sizzle. Similar lakes can be found near some shores of the Arctic Ocean. There, the size of the bubbles can reach several times the size of hot air balloons. Beautiful for sure, but not exactly safe. The next shocking lake is in Indonesia, the island of Java. You come to a majestic volcano, overgrown with grass and trees. The volcano seems to be asleep, but smoke is pouring out of it. You climb to the summit. Exhausted, tired, sweaty, you're ready to cool off. Nice work, you made it to the top. You look into the mouth of the volcano. Hmm, no boiling lava, just a beautiful, bright, turquoise lake down there. It looks like an oasis. Perfect time for a refreshing dip. You run down and get ready to jump in. But that's not water, that's acid! Sulfurous gases get into the lake from under the volcano. The lake itself is full of metals. When the gases touch them, they form that beautiful turquoise water. I mean, acid. Better head back to the nearest village, rest, and come back at night when it's cooler. In the dark, the lake seems to glow. Right above it, you see light-filled, exploding little clouds. The sulfurous gases rise out of the lake, combine with the air, and flash bright blue. Still, don't get too close. The sea turns sinister red, and no living being can survive in it. Must be some dark magic. In fact, it's tiny algae that spread uncontrollably, giving the water this specific tint called the red tide. They have toxins that destroy sea mammals, birds, and turtles, as well as creatures that feed on them. For humans, contact with it ends in breathing problems or seafood poisoning. Sometimes even huge ships sink in the open seas for no visible reason. That reason is often the pockets of bubbles that underwater volcanoes produce even while they're sleeping. Those productive magma factories are hidden under 8,500 feet of water. When they wake up, they act just like land volcanoes, and they can cause destructive tsunamis. This tree looks like a bottle. No wonder it's called the bottle tree. It grows in Namibia and attracts many tourists. But don't get too close to the tree because it's one of the most dangerous on Earth. Milky juice flows inside the trunk. It's highly toxic to the human body. On the bright side, though, the trees have beautiful pink-white leaves with a red core. There's a tree growing in Western Australia that was once used as a prison. A cell for criminals existed inside the Boab prison tree for a long time. People were usually kept there temporarily, just for one night. After that, they were taken to their final destination. The prison was built more than 1,500 years ago and has been perfectly preserved to this day. Tourists visiting this place can sneak a peek.